And I'm going to read from the Heidelberg Catechism. And the sermon is in connection with the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 32, the 32nd section of the Catechism, which we teach in this church Sunday by Sunday. Um, we're going to read Lord's Day 32, and the sermon will be about Lord's Day 32, and, and also the, the scripture passages that you see listed underneath Lord's 32 will be used extensively. Lord's Day 32. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace alone through Christ, without any merit of our own, why must we yet do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit to be his image so that with our whole life we may show ourselves thankful to God for his benefits, and he may be praised by us. Further, that we ourselves may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and that by our godly walk of life we may win our neighbors for Christ. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and impenitent walk of life? By no means. Scripture says that no unchaste person, idolater, adulterer, thief, greedy person, drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's far the catechism. Congregation of Christ, one of the great questions of our time is Am I a good person? It may be related to that. How can I become a good person? And beyond that, who judges what is good for me and why? In our neighborhood, I hear this all the time. I often hear I'm a good person. I don't drink or smoke. I don't cheat on my spouse. I, I try to do as much good as I can. I haven't hurt anybody. I'm a good person, aren't I, Pastor Eric? And then there's the other question that often comes up in the neighborhood, too, where people say, isn't Christianity just about being a good person? And since I'm trying to be a good person, why do I need Christianity? And often when I'm having these discussions, the question on the tip of my tongue is, why? And by why, I mean, if someone is not a Christian, why be good? I mean, many people are trying to be good, and we're thankful for that as Christians, but when I ask them the question, why are you good? Why are you trying to be a good person? I don't ever get an answer. Or the answers I get don't make a lot of sense. Why be good if I'm not a Christian? I mean, if I wasn't a Christian, I'm not sure I would be good at all. Many of you know my background. If I had not been a Christian, I'd probably be a corrupt politician. Like a Kevin Spacey in House of Cards. Or a corporate titan squeezing profit at all costs, at the cost of the environment and the workers. Or a mafia crime lord. Why not? Why is... Being a mafia crime lord, a less legitimate life than a middle class person living in a house here, raising children and doing the right thing. As an aside, this shows us that, contrary to popular opinion, God made me a pastor, not because I'm the best of all people, but probably the worst. In order to keep me on the straight and narrow, God knew that I needed extra time in scripture being a pastor, and actually that I needed to be pastored by my congregation rather than the other way around. I'm not telling anyone that. We need Jesus. But the question is, if we don't have him, why be good? So I asked the internet, what did the internet say about why a person should be a good person? And Google gave me some answers. Chat GPT was full. So I use Google instead. I'll quote some of them briefly. A computer programmer from India says, these qualities, by he means good qualities, make life easier. 
A man from Texas said, you should be a good person because it's better for your mental health. Another person said, being good is wise because it works. Or because the world is full of neg negativity. Or being good allows you to be authentic to yourself. I find that one most striking. Or here's another one. Virtue is its own reward. You've stacked the odds in your favor if you do good. Karma. And then some people asked and answered the opposite question. Listen carefully. Do I even have to be a good person is the question. One person said, no, you don't need to be a good person. People expect you to be good if you are bad, and the same people want you to be a brat if you're good to them. Be the way you've been till now. People won't accept you in any form, so don't care about what anyone says. Here's another guy, and this is fascinating. He says, be rotten as you... As, be rot as rotten as you want to be as long as you know that misery begets misery. As long as you're fine being unhappy, then it's good. Just don't cause any undue physical harm to anyone, he says, and listen, here's why. That would land you in jail where you would be forced to be good. You want to keep your freedom, so just be moderately bad but not too bad. I think we can laugh at some of this as Christians a little bit, but it's sort of not funny because people, I think they believe this. And I, as, as Christians, we ought not to, to take a sort of looking down attitude on this because I wonder if a lot of this thinking is more alive in us than we would care to admit. Is it true in this church that we think more like the Bible than the Internet? I mean, ask yourself the question, why do you do good things? I was tempted to take a minute of silence here, but I won't, for your sake. But why did you come to church today? Why do you put money in the collection bag? Why do you talk to people after church versus not? Do your motivations... To, the answers to those questions resemble the internet or what Jesus would teach. Now this stuff matters because you will only ever be as good as your answer to the question. You become what you want. Here's an example. If you do good because it makes your life easier, what would happen then if evil made your life easier? What if murder made your life easier? Actually, that's why most many murders happen, I think. What if anger makes life easier? What if punching someone in the face helps you feel authentic? Why not? You see, these answers have consequences. Your beliefs have consequences. The Internet's answers have consequences. Of course, many of us think that theology is dry and boring and only for pastors, but the, the, every one of us lives theology every single day. And if you don't have theology in your life, you have adopted philosophy instead. All of life is theology. Every decision you make is theological. And so today we're going to talk about why should we do anything good the good news is, is that Jesus has lots to say about this. And the Catechism uh, tries to summarize the biblical answer to the question. And that's why in Lord's Day 32, the question is asked, since you are delivered by grace, right? And then the final line, why do good works? Why? Not can you or should you, why do you and why must you? Why should you do good versus evil? And again, I want to illustrate this. If I'm sitting in my house and I know somebody needs my help, why go out and help them rather than stay home? Or should I take the extra effort to love my wife and children rather than watching my favorite TV shows? More? <laughs> 
Should I support my children and love them rather than controlling them and forcing them into my expectations through my anger? Should I take the extra effort to be grateful rather than greedy? Should I rather try to be a good listener rather than inflicting my speech on everybody without ever listening to them? Should I be an encourager in the church or a grumbler or complainer? Why? Why one and not the other? It's fascinating that the catechism's answer is very simple. Very simple. The catechism has arguments, but first it says something very simple. Look at look what it says. Two words. Because Christ. Because Christ entered your life. Because when Christ saw you as a harassed, helpless sheep, he did not look away from you. He saw you. Because Christ, when he sees you, doesn't sit there and stand over you in judgment. He says to you in Matthew 11, verse 28, No, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Because Christ, when he saw a treasure in a field, you know what he did? Did he walk away? No, he sold everything he had, his body, to dig that treasure up and show it love for an eternity. Because Christ loves you more than you ever dared imagine. The chasm says, since we have been delivered from our misery by grace alone through Christ. Because Christ is breaking into your reality like an arrow through a chink in the armor rooting around in your soul and tossing out everything that's evil in there. Because Christ is protecting you from the devil with his rod and his staff so that you are safe from the designs of evil in this world. Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is drawing you to himself so that you can be held in his arms at the moments when you need him most. Because now that Christ exists in your life, nothing can be the same. See, the whole Bible, brothers and sisters, is filled with God's desire for you. That's why the Bible uses this word covenant everywhere. Why does the Bible talk about the covenant all the time? Well, the covenant is simply a formalized relationship. Bound with promises from God. And God wants relationship with you. Covenant. Because Christ knows you. When Christ redeemed you with his blood and his death, violent as it is, it's the most dramatic Valentine's card the world has ever seen. We think that love comes in a card on Valentine's Day. Well, that is a pathetic view of love. If you're not ready to die for someone, or do you really love them like Christ did? And how can such love of Christ not then melt our hearts into a dribbling mess of tears? How can such riches offered to us not then create a change in our being that desires that we would be like him in thankfulness? How does this not result in a lifelong relationship of sacrifice? The Bible teaches us that the only appropriate response to the grace of Christ is a life of sacrificial gratitude. Countless passages make that point. I'll list a couple of them. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then, listen, do not quench the Spirit. So not being thankful is to quench the Spirit, potentially. 
Ephesians 5 verse 20. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3 verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. We are respond to the magnificent love with this heart of all. Oh, what have you done for me? How can, what can I do for you now that you've done this? I mean, it defies comprehension that a soldier would jump on a grenade for his friends and his friends would not be thankful. It just cannot be. It stands to reason that whatever part of my life in which thankfulness is not driving the bus is a part of my life in which Jesus is not Lord. The root of why the Christian does good is because he looks at Christ and he says, I got to give my life to that guy if that's what he did. This comes the question, our second point, how? Yes, we love Christ. We know we should be thankful. But why is it that many of us still aren't thankful? How does one become more thankful? How does one gain the energy to do good? To want to do good. And here's where the internet's answers, again, are so inadequate. The internet's answer is very simple. Be good because you just have to. And you should just do it. And just try. And I think often this attitude seeps into the church, too. There's sort of an attitude that, well, those people over there, they've done a bad thing. What a bunch of fools. Get it together. And then even in the preaching, hey everybody, your job is to get your act together. Up to it. Don't you realize how important it is to be good? Or, I'm saddened by your failure to be good. Guilt. So how does someone grow in thankfulness so that they actually want to do good? That they want to be faithful to Christ? Well, two passages come to mind here. Actually, just one here. I'll, the other one will come later. A fascinating passage. We, we began reading it earlier. Colossians 3, verse 15. We just read verse 14 earlier. Or actually, it's verse 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. May we read this? So how does one be thankful? The next line. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. How does one become thankful? How does one let the peace of Christ rule in his or her heart? Well, we let the message of Christ dwell in us richly. Christian becomes thankful when he or she looks at Jesus Christ and meditates on what, who Jesus is. And who lets who Jesus is and the gospel move in their hearts and become our heart. It's like Jesus' teaching on the vine in John 15. Each Christian is a branch on the vine of Jesus. Jesus is the trunk coming out of the ground. We're branches in the vine. And the branch is supposed to produce fruit. But how does the branch produce fruit? Does the branch squeeze hard? Squeeze the fruit out? No. The branch is a conduit. The branch produces fruit by drinking deeply of the sap coming out of the trunk. It's backwards to try produce fruit. The thing that Christian needs to do is dwell in Christ. It seems like a paradox, but in reality we know it to be true. It's a little bit like, and this example is not great, but it's a little bit like when you're sitting on an airplane and the airplane loses cabin pressure. And the instruction from the flight attendant is, don't help people until you put your mask on. If you don't put your mask on first, then if you try to help other people, you're going to die and they're going to die. You need the oxygen from the mask to be able to help anybody. 
And it's funny that the commands of Scripture are often driving in that direction. It's no God. You know? Dwell in Christ. And then things just appear. Jesus is the oxygen of the Christian life. It's somewhat paradoxical, again, if we think of things this way, to say, I'm going to try do good things without spending any time knowing Christ or being in prayer with him or reading his word or, or listening to the gospel. You see, and here's the thing. What is the gospel doing in us? If we listen to Christ, we know him, we dwell in him. What's happening? Well, Jesus is using the, is filling us with the Holy Spirit and the gospel and the spirit work together. Look what it says here. In the, in the catechism, because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit to be his image. And here you have a fascinating thing again. Who's producing good in your life? Are you doing it? No. It's his initiative first. Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now listen. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. What? Are you saying that everything I do, God prepared for me? Am I a robot? No. It's entirely predictable in some ways what we might do for Christ once we really understand him. And we go inward to Christ before we go outward so that what we do for Christ looks like Christ. So being God's law without Christ is to effectively manipulate God's law into doing something it was never meant to do. That's what Jesus tells the Pharisees again and again and again. And even God, God is the Father. Think about all the, the parables of Jesus. There's the, the prodigal son. He comes home after this long journey away. And the Father, what does the Father do when the prodigal son comes home? He simply welcomes him in his arms. That's all he does. And the elder brother says, Hey, I've been tending your, your sheep and your cattle all this time. Where's my recognition? The father's like, what are you talking about? My arms have been open the whole time. The point Jesus is making is he's saying, I fill you with good. Come to me and I will fill you with what you need. I send the Holy Spirit. And the, the source of any good in your life comes from me, not your initiative. 2 Peter 2 verse 4 is fascinating. We read it earlier. It says there, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, what? You may participate in the divine nature. That's the, the fundamental origin. We're, we're participating in God and then God is now working in us to turn us into Christ. Human effort, brothers and sisters, is not going to produce good in this life unless powered by the Spirit. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus attacks false motivation all the time. And Jesus even says, listen, if you try to do good without me, without my Spirit, your good will end up being self-righteous and proud. Look at it says in Matthew 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. And Jesus' point is bigger too. He's saying, if you're not doing good because you're filled with the Spirit, you're probably doing good for something bad. Your motivations are probably corrupt. If not, for sure, corrupt. And Jesus is saying, if you're not doing it out of me and in me, you're probably, one of the major reasons you're doing it is the applause of other people. Or maybe your motive is your own performance or some standards you create for yourself or whatever. And we ought to take this very seriously, this risk that we carry as Christians. I mean, I, earlier I asked you, why did you all come to church today? 
Did you come for the gospel? Or did you come to perform your faith that you want the rest of us to see that, yes, you are a good Christian? Sometimes that's why I come to church, to my shame. Come to church to make sure that nobody judges me as a bad pastor. Of course, even though we have bad motivation, we still come to church. There's a sense in which we overcome the bad motivation and do the thing anyway because it's good, yes. But we ought to be disturbed by how our poor motivations because bad motivation produces evil. Now I need to perform my faith in front of other Christians. And so, oh, look at that person who didn't come to church. What a terrible person they are because they didn't work as hard as I did to get here. Pretty soon, being a Christian becomes your performance if you accept that that's what it is. And that's not the gospel. That's just burden and law. It's awful. It has nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. We come to church because we need life from Jesus. And even if we don't want to be here, it's still important to know we're going to come. Yes, because I need the life that comes from the Word of God. And, And I need the Spirit to move me. And I pray, God, please fill me with your Spirit that I may do what I'm supposed to do even though I don't want to. This is our third point, the benefits. Jesus is taking initiative in your life to produce good in you through the power of the Spirit. The Catechism lists a number of benefits for Jesus' action in you. And you can read that in the catechism here. There's a number of them. He renews us by his Holy Spirit to be his image. Why? So that with our whole life, what? We may show ourselves thankful to God for his benefits. So he's producing thankfulness in us. But also, he may be praised by us as well. Now, first of all, we're thankful. And underneath this question and answer here, you'll see, if you read your catechism, you'll see, we may show ourselves thankful to God for his benefits. And there's a little one there. If you go down to the bottom, you'll see the, the one, there's passages listed there that support this idea, this theology. Romans 6, verse 13, 12, verse 1, and 2, and then 1 Peter 2, verse 5 through 10, which we read earlier. Oh, sorry, we didn't read that. We read 2 Peter uh, 1 earlier. In Romans 1, Romans 12, sorry, verse, verse 1, says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so what the catechism is getting at is that this thankfulness that's being talked about it's allied closely with what we would call sacrificial life. The Christian is not simply someone who tries to be good. The Christian is someone who has offered his or her entire life as a sacrifice for Jesus, and that's what he calls worship. In response to the, the mercy of Jesus Christ, which Paul talks about in the first 11 chapters of Romans, and then in Romans 12, there's that great hinge. Now, what do we do in response to what Jesus has done while we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? The Catechism uses the word um, thankfulness or gratitude in conjunction with this idea. The point being, thankfulness and self-sacrifice are a way of life, not just something we do or perform. It's a way of life that comes from inside the heart and reflects with fruit on the outside. It cannot be manufactured by men. 
And it's a way of life that's powered by worship, powered by giving everything to Jesus. It's led by, oh, that's what he wants? Okay, I'll do it. Yes. So he's powering it on the back end. He's giving you the energy to do it. And you're doing it towards him. Which means nothing in the Christian life can be apart from Christ. And you guys know, you know people that live this way. There's a warmth to the kind of people that live out of Christ and for Christ. There's a readiness to encourage all the time. These are the people that we want, we're drawn to somehow. It's a way of being that's hard to describe, but we all know it when we see it. Not all of us are good at doing it. Even I struggle with this. To really just be in Christ so richly that you just exude this sort of spirit-led graciousness, self-sacrifice. You can call this person and they're there for you without any judgment no matter what. And the second thing that comes is that a spirit-led Christian will praise God. 1 Peter 2 verse 9, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so when the Spirit works in someone and they, they know Christ and they recognize what Jesus has done, praise emerges. And it's funny, in our world today, Offering worship to God seems like the most utter folly. To those who don't know Christ, they say, what on earth are you doing on Sunday? Why would you sit there and worship people when you could be feeding the poor? What practical purpose does praising God even have? But that's because they don't understand that fundamentally Christianity is not about what you do, but who you know. I remember Eugene Peterson, the famous pastor, once commenting that he said what people in his church most needed was worship. And it was when they worshipped that good things began to result. When they praised God. And he always felt that worshipping God was the most appropriate use of his time. And Eugene Peterson was a famous pastor that had an impact on millions of people. Why? Was it because he looked for it? No. Because he was a man who spent, spent his life worshiping God and trying to find ways to do it more. And, and he, because of that, he exuded an energy <clears throat> that other people wanted. Just one example of that. Praising God led everything else. And it makes sense. It makes sense that the Christian's most fundamental and most natural duty is to praise God because that's exactly what we're going to do in eternity. And what are we, if not people, in which eternity is emerging? Jesus is doing nothing if not building heaven into us so that we begin to resemble heaven before we get there. He is heaven. That's why he always says, I'm, the kingdom of heaven is near. And becoming the image of Christ is to enter the heavenly realm. Now third, our spiritual growth also provides assurance that our faith is real. So further, we ourselves may be assured of our faith by its fruits. The Bible says this very clearly. Matthew 7, verse 17. Likewise, every tr good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. 2 Peter 1, verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. In other words, yes, God chose you. Now, if you live like a Christian, it will become clear that, yes, he indeed chose you. So, if you want assurance for your faith, do good. It's not necessarily to say, okay, go obey the, the Ten Commandments. No, it's participate in Christ, love his church, praise his name, do the things that Christians do. Show encouragement. Doing evil or being lazy with spiritual things will inevitably lead to a lack of assurance. It's often exasperating to be a pastor and to watch people who rarely come to church, 
never have, have no prayer life, don't read scripture, don't spend time around other Christians, have no interest in stopping their sin, and then have the audacity to suggest that it's the church's fault or somebody else's fault that they lack faith. It's God's fault that suffering hasn't been removed from their life. It's God's fault I'm the way I am. Well, no, it's yours. I'm only going to serve God if he does what I want. That is not worship. You are not the judge of who God is and who he is not. Live the Christian life. Do good. Participate in it. And God will give you the assurance. It comes from him. And he'll give it to you even in the midst of your suffering. It helps. Your witnessing, your, your participation in the spiritual things of Christ is a witnessing to your own heart that Christ is at work in you. And fourth, that we may win our neighbors for Christ. Our godly walk of life, we may win our neighbors for Christ. So we, we do good, we want to do good as a witness. So Jesus, or 1 Peter 2 verse 12, he says, Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Fascinating. In Matthew 5, verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others. That, why? Why? Listen, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Another question, what's your light? What is the light? Is the light that you go to church? No, because that's not what the Bible says. Your light is what Christ is doing in you through the Holy Spirit. Your light is who you are with Christ versus who you would have been without him. What is Christ doing in you? Well, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So these things are the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit are the antithesis of the flesh. So those are the things that people are going to say, whoa, they've got that? Why, where does that come from? So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, your light is not what you do for God. Your light is what God is doing in you. None of the fruits of the Spirit is possible through human effort. You notice that? Can I just become more peaceful? Do I just become kind by trying? Do I just... No, a lot of these things, they, they spring out of us when the Spirit is at work, when we're in Christ. And often the hallmark of a, a real spirit-led Christian is that he or she, sh the fruits of the spirit and the, the light of Christ shines brighter when the affliction gets greater. So the affliction doesn't snuff out the light. The affliction fans the flame. Because in the affliction, the person recognizes that they only need Christ and all the rest of this stuff, junk needs to go. The suffering strips away the flesh until only Christ is left. And then, whoosh, the flame goes. It's often fascinating that when conversions happen in response to conversions, and someone else sees someone else change, they go, hey, I, I, need, I need that. Whatever that is, I, I got to have it. The change cannot be explained in human terms, and so the person becomes interested in the gospel, because how else do we explain this? And again, how do we kindle the kind of change while we live in Christ. How do we disciple Christians so that they burn brighter? We bring them to the waters of Christ. It's all about him. He is the life-giving sap. He is the good news. Whatever good we have is from him and in him and to him. And that's good news because if it was any other way, we'd already have failed. The church would already have disappeared a long time ago. If it was anything other than that, we'd be another religion. In Matthew 6, verse 33, the good news is, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, 
And all these things will be given to you as well. And that is the most beautiful part of our thankfulness in Christ. Is that we walk towards him. And in him everything else begins to happen. And of course we participate in that, no doubt. But fundamentally, it flows from him. And that is a huge relief. And we can rest. Christ is at work. He will do it. That's enough for me. Amen.